Today on The Hookup, we're gonna build the ultimate customizable ceiling light, including eight individually dimmable and controllable LED spotlights and an LED ambient light. In addition to smart home technology, one of my other interests is design, where I often lead towards a more modern aesthetic. Around 10 years ago, I built this entertainment unit for our family room. But when we moved into our new house, the lighting never really seemed to match. After looking around for the perfect light for our needs, I decided that building it myself seemed like the best option. After a quick mock-up and sketch-up to look at different lighting configurations, my wife and I decided on a design, and it was time to start building. For this project, I used eight of these 12-volt LED spotlights, a 12-volt LED strip light, a 12-volt power supply, some N-channel MOSFET transistors, a prototype board, some header pins, and then everything is controlled by an ESP32-based Node MCU. Normally, I use ESP8266-based Node MCUs, but in this project, the ESP32 was a much better option. And to explain why, we need to know a little more about how dimmable LED circuits work. When dimming an old incandescent bulb, a dimmer switch worked by adding a variable resistor into the circuit, which would effectively limit the current flowing into the bulb. Because there was less current, the filament heated up less and therefore produced less light. Dimming an LED isn't quite as simple, since they generally operate at narrow voltage and current ratings. Instead of sending less current, the LED dimming is done by rapidly turning the current on and off in a process that's called pulse width modulation, or PWM. If you were to turn a bulb on for one second and then off for one second, you would produce half the light that you would if you had just left the bulb on for the full two seconds. But you would obviously notice that the bulb had turned off. If you instead turn the bulb on for a millisecond and off for a millisecond, and then you repeat that process over and over for a full two seconds, you'd notice that the bulb was 50% less bright, but you wouldn't notice that the bulb was flashing. Since the lights are on for 0.001 seconds and off for 0.001 seconds, that means that the whole cycle takes 0.002 seconds. And we can complete 500 of these cycles in one second, which is called its frequency. And it's measured in hertz. The unit hertz just means number of times per second. And since we can do 500 cycles per second, this is a frequency of 500 hertz. The second part of a PWM signal is called the duty cycle which is the time that the circuit is on divided by the total duration of the cycle. In this example, we turned on the light for one millisecond and our cycle duration was two milliseconds. So our duty cycle is 50%. The duty cycle determines how bright the LED appears and the frequency determines how noticeable the flickering is. I love the ESP8266 based Node MCU and I use it for the vast majority of my projects. But it generates a PWM signal using software and processing power. This means that when the Wi-Fi traffic gets high or if you're using the processor to do some other calculations, it will lower the PWM frequency in order to compensate for that, which results in noticeable flashing. The ESP32 has eight built-in independent hardware PWM channels, which are timers that aren't responsible for anything other than producing a consistent PWM signal at insanely high frequencies, up to 300,000 hertz. For this project, I'm gonna use a more modest frequency of 600 hertz, because it's generally accepted that humans can't perceive any flickering in frequencies over 200 hertz. So we'll triple that just to be safe. Some cheap LED bulbs end up with frequencies around 60 Hertz due to the way that they switch between AC and DC current. This can cause headaches for some people, but these bulbs should be buttery smooth because of our ESP32 control. You'll also notice that the bulbs that I used for this project specifically say that they are non-dimmable, but this actually only refers to their power supply circuit. And since we're providing our own power supply and our own driver, all we need are the LEDs. And there's actually no difference between dimmable and non-dimmable LED chips. So buying the non-dimmable type will save us a few bucks. Enough talking, let's build some stuff. I started out by cutting the 14 inch by 14 inch square that would become the main light. I used a table saw to cut down some leftover birch plywood that I had laying around from another project, but you absolutely don't need a table saw for this project. 
A circular saw or a jigsaw or even a hand saw would work fine. Next, I cut the pieces that would become the base of the light. Originally, I cut them six inches tall, but after a quick dry fit, I decided that was too tall. So I cut an inch and a quarter off to put the base at a total height of four and three quarter inches. Then I drilled pocket holes to attach everything together so you wouldn't see any noticeable fasteners on the outside. I've gotten a bunch of use out of this Craig Jig Junior and it's significantly cheaper than the full jig. If you like to build things and you don't have a pocket hole jig yet, I highly recommend this one. I drilled four holes in the two side pieces and screwed them together. It was too tight to fit a screwdriver inside when I was putting the, the final sides together, so I used a socket wrench to drive the final four pocket screws in. Next, I marked the center of each LED hole and I used the largest hole saw I had, which was 2 and 1 8 inches, to cut the holes for the lights. When using a hole saw, drilling all the way through from a single side can cause significant tear out. So to prevent this, you should flip your workpiece over once the pilot hole goes all the way through. It also makes it much easier to remove the cutout hole from the bit. After a quick test fit, I realized that the largest hole saw I owned wasn't going to cut it. At this point, I searched for how much a two and three quarter inch hole saw costs, and I decided to just use my router to make the holes bigger instead. If you have a two and three quarter inch hole saw, you can save yourself a bunch of time by drilling the correct size hole the first time. Of course, my routered holes aren't perfect circles, but there's enough bezel around each LED that the holes don't really need to look all that nice. I also took the opportunity to hog out a little bit of material above each of the lights to give them a little more clearance. A jigsaw would have been the best tool for this, but I already had my router out, so some concessions were made. This wasn't exactly a precision process, but I wasn't too worried about it since none of this would be visible once the light was actually installed. Once I was done with the router, I did a quick test fit of the lights before moving on to the detail work. To give it a more finished look, I used a heat gun to attach some edge banding over the unfinished plywood edges. A clothing iron is the best tool for applying edge banding, but the iron was upstairs and the heat gun was in my garage, so again, a few more concessions were made. The key to good edge banding is to make sure that there's a small overhang on both sides, allowing you to sand it flush later on. To start, I used some 80 grit sandpaper to knock down the overhangs on the edge banding and take care of the small amount of tear out that happened on the LED holes. Then I switched to 220 grit to finish off. I definitely don't have the patience for the detail work of woodworking, my general mantra is that if the sanding can't be done with a power tool, it's probably not going to get done. Thankfully, my wife has much better attention to detail and is therefore in charge of painting or staining all of our projects. She does a significantly better job than I ever could. While my wife worked on the finish, I started to put together the circuit board to control the lights. As we discussed earlier, the ESP32 can generate a great PWM signal with high accuracy but it does so at 3.3 volts and a very low current. So trying to drive 12 volt LEDs with that signal just wouldn't work at all. We need to step up the voltage using a transistor. And when you're working with different voltages, the best way to switch between them is a transistor that's called an N-channel MOSFET. A MOSFET has three pins, the gate, the source, and the drain. The Cliffs notes for transistors is that applying a small voltage to the gate will allow a larger voltage to flow from the drain to the source. A transistor essentially works like a variable resistor. The more voltage that's applied to the gate, the less resistance there will be between the drain and the source. And once you reach a voltage called the threshold voltage, the resistance essentially goes to zero. 
which is what we want. To be absolutely certain I was reaching the threshold voltage, I decided to use a logic level converter to change the 3.3 volt logic of the ESP32 to 5 volt logic. According to the data sheet on these MOSFETs that I used, the threshold voltage is only 2 volts. But in practice, I found that even at 100% duty cycle, the LEDs weren't coming on quite at full brightness. If you want to make this project, I'd recommend you use a slightly different transistor than I did. I've posted the link to the better transistors with the lower threshold voltage down in the description. If you use those transistors, you should be able to skip the logic level converter and make a lot less wiring for yourself. For each LED spotlight, the GPIO pin outputting the PWM signal on the ESP32 goes through the 3 volt to 5 volt logic level converter and then into the gate on the MOSFET. The positive terminals on the LEDs connect to the positive 12 volt terminals of the power supply and the negative of each LED connects to the drain pin of the MOSFET. The source pin of the MOSFETs are all connected together and go to the ground terminal on the 12 volt power supply which is also connected to the ground of the ESP32. This same circuit essentially just gets repeated 8 times with 8 different GPIO pins on the ESP32, one circuit for each LED spotlight. I'm running the ambient lights on a different switch because I have two different light switches for this particular light. But if you wanted the ambient lights to be controlled by your ESP32, you would just add another MOSFET circuit. I used two of the 12 volt adapters that came with the LED spotlights to power my LED strip. This ensured that I wasn't drawing too much current from these cheap 12 volt adapters. I wired up everything on a prototype board using these quick connect harnesses to make it easier to change out the LEDs if they were to malfunction or burn out. I also made four quick connect extensions to make it easier to wire the corner LEDs. The last thing I needed to do to finish the wiring was power the node MCU. To do this, I used something called a buck converter to convert the 12 volt power into 5 volts. When setting up a buck converter, first disconnect the power from your ESP32 or remove it from the header pins. Then connect the 12 volt source and turn the set screw on the buck converter. Measure the output current until you get a current that you're happy with. I'd recommend slightly under 5 volts for the ESP32. Next, I wrote a bit of code in the Arduino IDE to control the PWM signal. If you've ever coded with Arduino, you're probably familiar with the analog write function. Unfortunately, analog write hasn't been implemented yet for the ESP32. So PWM signals are generated through something that's called LEDC. LEDC requires that you specify a frequency and duty cycle for each hardware timer you want to use. As we discussed before, we're going to use a frequency of 600 Hz and we'll adjust the duty cycle based on an 8-bit integer. This means that 0 will be 0% duty cycle or full off and 256 will be 100% duty cycle or full on. Each light has a separate MQTT topic to accept brightness messages and each will publish its current state, on or off, to a specific state topic. I'm controlling my light with an open source home automation program called Home Assistant, specifically the version of it called HASS.io. If you've never heard of it and you want to get into home automation, I highly recommend you check it out. In my opinion, it is absolutely the best consumer grade option there is. And it has an amazing community of users out there willing to help you get started. In my configuration file for Home Assistant, I'll add these eight entities under the light domain. One for each LED spotlight. I'll also add a group that contains all eight of the lights, which will allow me to turn them on and off and set their brightness as a group. I tested out all the functionality on the floor before I installed it. And after a bit of troubleshooting due to a bad solder joint, I was ready to install. After turning off the power of the breaker, I removed the old light and marked the locations of the mounting screws. I drilled slots in the mounting plate to allow me to adjust the angle of the light once it was hanging, and then installed it with some washers and pulled the wires through the mounting holes. I connected those wires to the LEDs using wire nuts and I put some screws on either side of the base to fix it to the mounting plate. After turning the power back on, all that's left to do is test it. Each channel can be controlled individually or as a group and can be set to a specific brightness by my Amazon Echo Dot. Alexa, turn the spotlights to 30%. Okay. Alexa, turn the spotlights to 10%. 
Overall, I'm really happy with the way this project turned out. And the lights are really bright, even though I bought the three LED version. Total cost of this project for me was around $60, since most of the parts that I used were left over from other projects. But if you needed to buy everything, including the wood, it would probably run you around $120. Amazon links to all the parts to build this project are down in the description, as well as links to the Arduino code you'll need to get this thing working. If you run into problems while making this project, you can leave a comment, and I generally respond within a few hours. If you enjoyed this video and you'd like to see more like it, please consider subscribing. And as always, thanks for watching The Hookup.